Welcome to Bluegrass. We are so glad that you joined us today. We hope you find this time together to be uplifting and inspirational. Above all, we want you to feel welcome. So if you have any questions, prayer requests, or just want to know more about how to get connected to Bluegrass, visit bluegrassumc.org connect. At the end of today's worship service, we will share Holy Communion. Take some time to gather some bread and juice or similar elements for yourself and those worshiping with you. Again, thanks for being with us today. Let's begin. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive, all my failures I try to hide. It was my dream till I met you. You called my name, and now I ran out of that grave. church together 
Let's lift up our God, the victorious Savior who rose from the grave. There's no one like our God. He is mighty. He is powerful. He is loving. He is gracious. So right where you're at, let's all sing together praises to our great God. Our Father, Creator, you mold our hearts together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty Savior. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us gracious to forgive us by your power we've been set free and lord we stand amazed in your presence astounded by your mercy and love our hands are lifted high and surrendered because your grace for me is always enough and there is no one higher than our god and there is no one greater than you let my life forever praise the glory of your name and there is no one higher Majestic in wonder, you reign in love forever. There's no one higher than you. Your beauty, your splendor, your glory knows no measure. There's no one higher than you. You are always with us. Gracious to forgive us, by your power we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high and surrendered. Because your grace for me is always enough. And there is no one higher than our God. And there is no one greater than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior, great and glorious. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender, because your grace for me is always enough. And there is no one higher than There is no one greater than you know. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than you. 
Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we give you thanks today for a new day, a new day to worship you, a new year. Oh, we have looked forward to a new year to come and worship and celebrate and give praise to you. We're ready to be done with the previous year, though we know just turning the page on the calendar may not change everything, but you do. And that's why we come and worship you. That's why we acknowledge you to be the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords, the one and only Savior that we find in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for this opportunity to begin the year in worship, to celebrate you, to honor you, to give praise to you for who you are, for what you have done, and what you're continuing to do, that you never give up on us, that you give us second and third chances, that you give us multiple opportunities to draw near to you. And I pray that for each of us individually. I pray that for our congregation. Then in the coming year, it will be one where we know we have drawn closer into your holy presence and that we will come alive spiritually more than we ever thought possible. And so I just pray that upon all of us who desire to have that deep abiding relationship with you. I pray for all in our congregation who might be struggling in some way, whether it's financially or whether it's in their physical bodies, whether it's financially or or relationally, in whatever way, Lord Jesus, we would ask that you would come and meet them at that point of need, that they would trust in you and look to you and find in you their source of salvation. So Lord, lead us, take us by the hand, shepherd us, guide and direct us. We need you. We want you. We look forward to taking this journey in the new year with you. We are hopeful. We're hopeful because of vaccines, but we're also hopeful because you are our God. And we look forward to going into this new year with you. Help us now as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let me say to you, Happy New Year. It's good to be in this new year with you, worshiping together as we begin this first weekend, acknowledging just how important our faith is, acknowledging how important our Lord is, and wanting to give Him our all and our best as we begin this new year. And so as we begin the new year, we begin a brand new message series on the Gospel of Mark that will take us all the way to Easter Sunday on April 4th. So I look forward to sharing this with you, and we're going to be reading through the Gospel of Mark together. We're going to be studying through the Gospel of Mark together. So I trust that you're making yourself available to all the information that you can find at bluegrassumc.org. Well, it's rather ironic. We've just spent the past five weeks plus celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we come to this new series in the Gospel of Mark, and there's not even a mention of Jesus' birth. I mean, what's up with that? The Gospel of Mark jumps right in to give us the most succinct details of Jesus' life and ministry. So if you are reading the Gospel through the, with the rest of the congregation we're going to discover that as the shortest of the Gospels, it's action-packed. There's no room for fluff in this Gospel. That's why many believe that this was the first Gospel written, so that Matthew and Luke had it in hand when they wrote their Gospels. And so they filled in some details that Mark chose not to include because it wasn't his Holy Spirit-inspired writing style. Well, early church tradition unanimously affirms that the author of this gospel is John Mark, or simply Mark. It's believed that Mark was Peter's younger associate and that he recorded Peter's words and memories 
into this gospel. Now, Mark was a cousin to Barnabas. Barnabas was a wealthy landowner who gave generously to the early church and was very instrumental in the church. Mark's mother's house was used by the early believers, we discover in the book of Acts, as a meeting place. Mark also joined Paul and Barnabas on early missionary journeys, and at one point there was a falling out between Paul and Mark, but they made up, and Mark came back together with Paul, and Paul asked for him to come while he was imprisoned in Rome. So we find that Mark was extremely instrumental in the advancement of the gospel through his super support role to the heavy hitters of the first century church. And so this role has carried on through the centuries, and we have his gospel today. And so Mark begins with the story of John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, we read these words. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So as we have proclaimed the good news throughout Advent and Christmas season, so we find Mark begins declaring the good news in a different way. Now, the description of the words good news is where we get our word for evangelism. Evangelism is good news. And strangely enough, it was first used to describe the birth of the Roman Emperor Augustus in 63 B.C. That was the first good news of a birth. So it appears that Mark might be coming out swinging, as he declares what the true good news is, it's not found in the kingdom of Caesar, but it's found in the kingdom of God. This kingdom is brought to you by none other than Jesus Himself, the Messiah, the Son of God, just as it had been prophesied. So Mark quotes a couple of scriptures. It's declared that they're from Isaiah. Actually, the first half of that scripture is from Malachi. The second half is from Isaiah. And Mark is saying that this is being fulfilled in real time. Now, as this simple map depicts, Bethany beyond the Jordan was the area in the wilderness northeast of Jerusalem where John did his baptisms. Now, this is the same exact area where the Israelites crossed the flooded Jordan River into the Promised Land, and this is the location where Elijah the prophet was swept up into heaven in a chariot of fire. So this is a holy place in the history of God. So the first half of that Old Testament Scripture that Mark makes reference to is from Malachi, who is declared that he would prepare the way and come like Elijah. The second Elijah, there would be one who would come just like Elijah did the first time. And so then we are given this description of John's prophetic apparel and diet and find him in the very location where Elijah was taken up into heaven. So with all of these similarities, John the Baptist had fulfilled the coming of the second Elijah. Mark wants to make that clear to us. Then the verse from Isaiah also speaks of one preparing the way in the wilderness that envisioned a new exodus. So again, in the same location where the people of God crossed over into the promised land, John announced the coming of one who would lead them into a new era of deliverance and salvation. You know, God's ways are truly amazing in that He fulfills His promises even in the same location where the original corresponding events occurred. In the same way that the prophets called Israel to repentance, we find John the Baptist calling Israel to repentance 
in preparing the way for the Messiah to come. And what a sight it was. Scripture tells us that people all over the countryside, all the people from Jerusalem, came out to John at the river to be baptized. They wanted to hear this new prophet of old preach the timeless message of repentance. And so they came, they confessed their sins, they repented, uh, they were baptized, they were forgiven of their sins. This massive response seemed to be an unscheduled spiritual awakening on the human calendar, but not on God's calendar, and is actually promised in Scripture when we do this. Look at Acts 3.19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Such times of refreshing, or we could say revival, or renewal, or reawakening, whatever term you want to describe, have occurred many times in large scales throughout history. In fact, one happened at my alma mater, Asbury University, 50 years ago. Though it happened 10 years before I arrived at the college, when I arrived, stepped foot on campus, stories were still being told about this famous revival. So on Tuesday, February 3rd, 1970, in Hughes Auditorium, during a regular chapel service that was scheduled to last 50 minutes, something happened. God's Spirit came in a real and powerful way in a time of refreshing or revival, went nonstop for 185 hours. 185 hours. Now, the spiritual awakening didn't come out of nowhere. The previous year, a young sophomore woman at the college led a small group of students to fervently pray, read Scripture, meet together, and share what they were learning from the Lord. Then on that Tuesday in February, a thousand students gathered into the chapel for a required service. The students who had made a covenant to pray sensed that there was something special that was going to happen that day. They were energized. Well, Asbury's academic dean, Custer Reynolds, got up to speak. He was scheduled to speak that day, and when he went to the microphone, he said he did not feel led to give his prepared remarks. Instead, he gave a personal testimony in his own life and then invited other students to come up and do the same thing to share how God was at work in their lives. And several students came and did so. One student came up and, and said this, I'm not believing that I'm standing here telling you what God has done for me. I've wasted my time in college up to now, but Christ has met me and I'm different. Last night the Holy Spirit flooded in and filled my life. Now for the first time ever, I'm excited about being a Christian. I wouldn't want to go back to the emptiness of yesterday for anything. Well, then other students came forward. They even confessed their sins in public. They gave their testimonies. Another professor, Dr. Clarence Hunter, went to the mic and invited any students who wanted to come forward to pray to come to the altar, and hundreds of students rushed to the front, and they were kneeling there four and five deep. In fact, throughout the whole auditorium, the students were kneeling wherever they could find a place confessing their sins, getting their hearts right with God. Hundreds of students gave their hearts to Christ that day. Many with tear-filled confessions acknowledged sins that they had committed with others who were in the room and publicly asked for forgiveness from them right then and there. And reconciliation took place on the spot. Well, this genuine revival spread across the street to the seminary it spread through the small town of churches. It even sm spread across the nation as students went out on weekends to tell what God was doing in their lives and what God had been doing on campus. As a result of such a weekend, a church in Anderson, Indiana, experienced their own revival that went on for 50 straight days. So by the end of May 1970, approximately 2,000 teams of students had gone out from Asbury College and Seminary 
into churches in other locales. By the end of the summer of 1970, there were 130 colleges, universities, and, and Bible schools that had been impacted by Asbury's revival. This is kind of what I envision happening with John the Baptist and everyone coming to the river. There was confession. There was repentance of sin. There was forgiveness. There was baptism. There was a lot of energy, a lot of excitement. As God was doing a brand new thing, they had no idea what to experience when they came, but wow, they experienced God powerfully. This is what happens when we humble ourselves before God and repent wholeheartedly of all of our self-seeking, proud ways. God shows up. God comes. And speaking of repentance, one commentator recently wrote this, how did such a good word like repentance end up with such a bad rap? I mean, the, the word conjures up negative images of doomsday preachers standing out on street corners. It's largely associated with words of stop, don't, and quit. But what if the word is actually positive? What if repentance is more about turning towards something rather than turning away? What if it also means go, do, and start? Now, don't get me wrong. True repentance is turning away from anything and everything that is unholy and ungodly and sinful and evil. So yes, there is a turning away. But also, for repentance to be complete, we must turn to something that is much better, that is good, that's beautiful, that's holy and pure and positive. Repentance is a reorienting of our lives toward the best thing imaginable. It's realigning our lives with what really matters most for eternity. And so, yes, it's, it's a breaking away from something, but it's a running towards something as well. It's the awakening of anticipation for God to do something new as we declare Him to be our Savior and Lord. It's a total surrender of our incomplete will for God's perfect will. So what's the message of John the Baptist today? Well, it's the same as it was then and every generation since then. It's a word that rises above and goes beyond the voices of our time. It's why the Word of God is so vitally important to us today. It's why we're encouraging you to read through the Gospel of Mark with us. Because only the Word of God transcends time and space, and carries the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make His path straight. And you do that through repentance. And John was faithful to preach that. People were responding, and guess what happened one day? Jesus came. They prepared the way of the Lord, and He came. He came to be baptized. Now, Jesus didn't need to confess sin or repent of sin. He never sinned he hadn't sinned he wouldn't sin however he came to identify with sinful humanity in such a way that he entered into the waters of baptism taking on our guilt and bearing it all the way to the cross mark chapter 1 verses 10 to 11 tell us just as jesus was coming up out of the water he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So here's the amazing trade that symbolized at Jesus' baptism. Jesus entered into the waters to bear our sin, to bear our guilt. He, he was buried beneath the water. He died. And then he exited out. He was raised to new life and was given that heavenly affirmation from the father himself declaring that jesus was his son whom he loved and was well pleasing to him and i want to declare to all of you who symbolically enter into the waters of baptism with honest confession and repentance when you place your faith and your trust in jesus who bears our sin and then when we emerge from that cleansing time Friends, we can hear that same heavenly voice say to you, you are my son, you are my daughter, whom I love, and I am well pleased with you. Now, we, we can't 
manufacture that on our own. These come from the Father because of what Jesus has done for us, not because we're so good, not because we stay away from certain things. No, it's because of our faith and trust in Christ who covers us in His righteousness. And so when the Father looks upon us, He sees His Son. And so He declares to us, You are my sons. You are my daughters. I love you. And I am well pleased with you. Even in your imperfections, I am pleased with you. A voice is calling out to you right now. Do you hear the voice? A voice is calling out that rises above and beyond all the noise of today. It's a voice that calls us to come clean with God. A voice that calls us to turn around and take hold of God's very best. Don't settle for anything less than God's best for your life. And it's a voice that will lead us to spiritual refreshment and renewal and revival and reawakening if, if we're willing to listen to the Word of God, if we're willing to confess our sin, to turn away and to turn wholeheartedly to God and allow the Holy Spirit to do a work within our hearts and our minds and continue to stay open to Him. Please pray with me this prayer of confession as a way to get us started in humbling ourselves before God. Most holy and merciful Father, I confess that I have sinned against You. By what I have done, by what I have left undone, I have not loved You with all of my heart and mind and strength. I have not fully loved my neighbor as myself. I have not always had your mind in mind. I have not been holy as you are holy. You alone now know how often I have grieved you by wasting my gifts, by wandering from your ways, by not responding to the cry of the needy. I confess that I have self-righteously condemned others and failed to confess my own sin. Today I repent of all my sin Please forgive and free me as I turn my heart to You. Renew in me the grace and strength of Your Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ, Your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let's sing together. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. you pray with me lord jesus we give you thanks once again for your great gift to us as we've celebrated your birth recognized your baptism and we know of your ministry that leads to death on a cross but it didn't end there it ended with resurrection ascension into heaven where you sit at the right hand of god the father almighty right now and You have promised to return to make all things new again. And so help us to truly repent, to turn away from all that is less than You, and to turn to You that is best for us. And so come, Holy Spirit, do a, a special work in each of our lives as we confess, as we repent, as we give ourselves anew to You at the beginning of this year. May we experience times of refreshing and renewal and revival within our spirits 
So please come, Holy Spirit, come. Come into our lives. Come into our congregation. Come into our community. Come into our world. We desperately need You and want You. And we thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken because we are a broken people. Take and eat, remembering this is His body given for you. This is the cup of Christ's shed blood for the forgiveness of sins. For without forgiveness of sins, there is no relationship with God our Father. But because of Christ's great gift to us, we are forgiven and welcomed into the family. Take and drink. We thank you, Jesus, for this incredible gift you have given to us. We thank you for worshiping with us this weekend. And we thank you for your faithfulness to be online, to gather together. And um, we look forward to continuing to worshiping in this new year. And, but more than that, to continue to grow deeper in our relationship with Christ. We thank you for your faithfulness to pray for Bluegrass, its ministry, its mission. We thank you for your financial support to keep your church going strong so that we can continue to do the ministry that we've been called to do. So Happy New Year. We pray God's blessing upon you in this new year, and we look forward to seeing you next weekend. Don't forget to invite somebody to come and join you in worship. Amen.